coffee with John most weeks, and uh, I met him on Tuesday, and, and he said, you know, I just feel great. Like, it's a beautiful day. I feel light and free. I don't have a care in the world right now. Um, I, just, I, I just have a new sense of, of freedom with my life. And I said, funny, John, because I feel more burdened. <laughs>
Paper was incredibly expensive. It wasn't paper. It was papyri. It was codexes and things like that. But but it was so expensive that they couldn't waste a space. So it looks like an incredibly long run-on sentence. Uh, but they didn't put spaces or punctuation because it would have been too costly to do that. It's as many letters as you can squeeze into a page. And um, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, they just threw out all the vowels. There's no there's no vowels to be spoken of, it's just the consonants, which actually if you start writing things in just consonants, you'll find that you can still read them, which is pretty impressive. Um, they came in and added some dots to help you figure out the vowels later after people had forgotten the language, but there's, it's all scrunched in there. Um, and what that reminds me of in, as we encounter scripture is that they weren't wasting words, you know? They weren't putting up something onto a blog that was, uh, had an immeasurable amount of space and didn't cost them a thing. Every word um, mattered when they put the stuff down. And so they didn't waste details telling us things that weren't useful. And so uh, we're going to slow down a bit. And um, the first stop we're going to take is, is um, verse 39. Jesus comes to the tomb and, and it seems like an additional thing to say, well, take away the stone. And I love Martha. Martha is actually a lot like my wife. Very practical. Jesus, you don't want to do that. <laughs> um, I know you think it'll be cool if we roll that stone away, but he's been there four days. That place is not going to smell so good anymore. Um, it's a stink. Uh, and the smell is uh, of death. Um, it's of decay. It's of um, the brokenness, which all through Scripture is tied to um, to sin. God comes that we might have life and have it to the full. And there is a thief who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And um, the smell of death is the smell of a lack of God, it seems. And um, the departure from God is the departure of life. And I don't know if you can connect that smell with something, but I, I have a few memories. I, I remember... Um, probably most recently being in my grandfather's hospital room. And there's a certain smell attached to it. It's crazy what smells do to our memories, right? Um, just the smell will like take you right back to that man. Um, I can remember sitting in my living room and the exact smell and sitting on a cover on the couch that was plastic and in the room that we weren't supposed to be in. And I put my feet up on, uh, on the table and my mom didn't comment. And I was like, uh oh. Uh, there's something bigger going on. And that was when I found out that my parents were getting a divorce, which was a significant moment in my life. Um, if you've ever been near a natural disaster in, in Ventura, California, we would have fires that would roll down the hill and you hoped it didn't leap across the road because we lived right across the road. It's a scary, scary thing. But that sight and that smell um, is a scary one for me. This is the smell um, that's going on. And, and then Jesus gives a very interesting answer. He says, yeah, but didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Will you roll away the stone? Will you enter the stink if God's glory could show up there? Um, it's a challenge because that's not how life is built. Most of our lives are built heading away from the stink. When we encounter the stink, um, we don't want to be near it. It repels us just as it would have repelled them. <coughs> yeah. And it reminded me of how I generally, for the most part, try to avoid unpleasant things. Um, I would rather be comfortable and have everything going right. And um, I would rather answer to people that, no, life is great right now, than actually tell them if there was something that wasn't great. Um, but if we're going to see the glory of God, if we're going to see the transformation to freedom and life, it's going to involve entering some stink. Um, it's going to be seeing things that are wrong in the world and engaging them instead of running away. Um, it's going to end up serving others and working with people when they're not at their best. Um, and perhaps the hardest part about it is that we're going to have to be honest and real about it when we're not at our best, too. And frankly, it's really easy to want to help somebody. It's really hard to want to be helped and to be open uh, to 
not having it all together, yet we don't have it all together. Um, but there's something about entering the stink with God that can bring forth God's glory. One of the first papers that I ever wrote was on, um, on, on meditating on scripture, and it was written by a Chinese pastor, and he had been put in prison, and, um, and then he was assigned the worst job. And the worst job was to actually empty the latrines into the place outside of camp where they would be taken. So it was basically to be the sewage manager for the entire prison. Um, and he said he loved this job. It made him stink. It was the worst possible place to be. But he loved this job because nobody would go near him or where he was working. And it was out here in the midst of the sewer that he could praise God to his full voice and he could speak scripture at the top of his lungs and he could be with God. Um, there's something about entering the stink with God and it, it's the part that drives me the craziest about the idea that life is somehow um, perfect once you know God. Because that's not helpful actually. <coughs> God wants to meet us in the midst of the mess. Um, we all grew up in families that weren't perfect. We learned patterns that weren't perfect. Um, you've gotten to know me a bit and one of the things that I learned very early on was um, my mom would always say, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Um, she was a single parent of four boys, so that was probably necessary advice. You can imagine our household. Um, but I kind of learned to keep things copacetic, keep things nice. Like, let's not fight. Let's not have any uncomfortable messes. Um, that is really problematic if you try to do marriage that way, by the way. Uh, it literally takes every bit of willpower and energy for me to go, stay in a fight with Christina so we can see this through to the best end possible. It just drains the heck out of me and it's caused a lot of problems. Um, my stink <clears throat> is that uh, avoiding things sometimes that shouldn't be avoided. We all have our particular stink. Um, the interesting thing is, this is the question I found myself asking. Was Lazarus, did Lazarus stink after Jesus called him forth or did his grave clothes stink? I think it's his grave clothes, actually. Grave clothes were, were simply this. Um, they were linen cloths that would be wrapped around a person, and then they would, they would pack them with herbs and stuff to try to cut down the smell. But, but a body starts to stink after a while. Um, and it was to allow time for people to come visit this person and pay their respects. Um, but eventually the smell would, would overcome it. Um, we all have a little bit of stink. Um, one of the most, do you guys like children's books? Anybody like children's books? I love children's books. I, I didn't like them until I married Christina. She was an elementary school teacher for 10 years. So she would break forth children's books that were amazing. And then while I was in seminary, she bought me a present. I need to show it to you. Um, it's a theologically profound book that she gave me. And, and it is called Everyone poops. It's a fantastic book, by the way. Um, I have no clue what the purpose would be to share this with a child, but it doesn't matter because it's so good. But it talks about how some poop on the move and some stop to poop and how large animals have big poop and small animals have tiny poops and some poop all over the place. But the point of it is simply this. Everybody poops. Uh, I gotta show you the last page just because it's so delightful. Everybody poops. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing about that is it's not something we ever talk about with each other or share with each other how that is going. And it stinks. Um, and we do the same thing with brokenness in our lives, don't we? Like, how often do you go, yeah, this is just a mess in my life? No, we, we go, oh no, you're okay. Your things are going good. Um, and yet, uh, pooping is incredibly healthy. Sin is not. And, and if we don't deal with it, if we don't engage the stink, if we don't roll away the stone, 
Um, it will impact our freedom and we will continue to encounter the same messes again and again. Um, the reason that we want life and freedom is because we all have the smell of these grave clothes around us and yet um, God can enter into that spot and Jesus has this incredible power to call out our name and to give life to start this resurrection thing and to um, bring life to where there is, was death he takes away the effect of it and yet um, we're somehow caught in between Paul, Paul described this being caught in between in Romans 7 and maybe you can identify with this I'm going to read it slow because it's a confusing passage to read fast, but he says this, The things that I want to do, I don't do. And instead, I do the things I hate. It, it's, it's a mystery to me. I'm pointing to this direction. This is where I want to go, and yet I keep finding myself doing stuff that I don't want to do. And I do these things that I hate. What a wretched person am I? Who could save me from this body of death? this smell around me of the brokenness that I keep putting off. And then he says this, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, the first step to freedom in life is the fact that God calls our name and out of his grace and mercy calls us out of death. That's the gift of Christ. It's an invitation to stop dying to walk out of a stinky tomb and to be alive. But it doesn't happen all at once. It says that he came out, but he was still bound. Um, those grave clothes wrapped up in, in herbs and spices. He has a giant bandana around his face and head. He can't see clearly. He probably can't walk clearly. I imagine trying to walk um, well in grave clothes would be a little <laughs> tough. Um, he looks like a giant tea bag, really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty amazing that he can walk. People are going, whoa. He was dead. Now he's alive. Look at him go. Um, I know in my own story, I, I had uh, started a spiral downward. I was... I was wrapped up in alcohol and drugs and these things were getting worse and my life seemed to be getting worse and I was depressed and discouraged and I called a friend of mine and she invited me to come to church and it took me a while to sort the stuff out but I know at church I felt a certain peace and a joy that I hadn't felt anywhere else. Um, it was a foreign experience to me, like I haven't felt this in years, this is strange, what's going on here? and lovely people would take me to lunch with them, despite me trying to push their buttons. I showed up for church in sweatpants and an Alice in Chains t-shirt just to see what the old people who were dressed up would do, and they said, want to come to lunch? <laughs> Very strange. Um, but as I discovered this, I began to like read the scripture, and I began to put my trust in God, and I, and I, I felt this joy, this life that I hadn't felt before. And I would go to work at McDonald's where nobody was happy. Nobody's happy working at a McDonald's. And, um, and it would be in the middle of a rush and everybody's freaking out. And, and I'm there smiling and grinning. And everyone thought I was still on drugs. Like, he must be high. He must be high at work, uh, which he's not supposed to do. Or else there's no way he could still be smiling. But God had called me out to start walking. Um, but I didn't have it all together. Not yet, not even today. Um, we step forward into this new life of Christ still bound up, and we need to get loose of our grave clothes. Um, we walk with a limp, it seems. Um, my mom has polio when she was a kid, had a brace her whole life, and she uh, definitely walks with a limp. I grew up looking at what it was like to do life with a limp. I have friends that, that uh, tell me that Christianity is a crutch for the cripple. Like, well, there's some people, some of us can do life just fine, but then there's other people who, who need a crutch, so they, they find uh, Christianity. And um, I usually answer them by saying, you and I understand the world a little differently. I think everyone's crippled. And if everybody's crippled, 
seems kind of foolish not to use the crutch that's there. Um, I remember getting a, a little minor cripple myself. I, I decided to do the most amazing skateboard trick I could think of. And it, it involves setting up the couch just outside of the kitchen. I was gonna, I was gonna launch off of the couch, put my skateboard under me, land in the kitchen, and roll into the backyard through the back door. This was the plan. It was brilliant in my mind. I could see it exactly how it was gonna go down. So I ran and I launched and the board did not land squarely underneath my feet. I did not roll out of the kitchen. Instead, I slammed to the ground, the board shot straight sideways and uh, I broke my wrist. I shouldn't have been skateboarding in the house anyway. <laughs> and I really didn't want to tell my mom, but that night she began to ask me why it was that my wrist was about three times the size of normal. <laughs> And uh, we eventually went in and realized I had broken my wrist. I had fractured it. And I got a cast put on it. Um, imagine if now, 20 years later, I still walked around with said cast. Well, you know, I broke my wrist. It's just a part of me now. Got my cast signed by everybody who was in seventh grade. So that's cool. Um, <laughs> If I still walked around with that, you guys would think I was a complete idiot. You'd go, you need to go in and get that thing taken off. This is not good. It's starting to stink. That's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have a cast sometimes to help us heal, but, but it needs to get taken off. And Jesus is not content leaving us just the way we are. <clears throat> he wants to unwind the stuff. He wants to get as to where we don't stink as much. Um, the family patterns and the sin habits and the need for recognition and the whatever it is that we struggle with, so often we think it has to be a part of us forever. And the good news is it doesn't. Um, God has a plan. And the worst part about these grave clothes that we have is that you can't unwind them yourself. That's not the plan. Uh, we need help taking them off. And, and this, is, this is the brilliant part of this story. Um, Verse 44, Jesus said to them, you guys, take off his grave clothes. Let him go. Literally, loose him so he can move. Freedom. Allow him to be who he would, is. Made by God. Free. To move freely again. Um, who is it who unwinds the people? Un unbinds Lazarus? It's, it's the other people. Um, by the way, really discouraging. This was a brilliant insight to me. I'd never seen this before in all of scripture. I walk in this morning and I go, how are you, Jonathan? And he goes, well, I'm sick, which you wouldn't notice by how he led worship. So thank you, Jonathan, for leading us even when you're sick. Um, and I say, well, I'm preaching on John 11. And he says, you know what I love about that passage? Jesus has all the other people unbind him. And I'm like, no. Ah. Sorry, sermon's got nothing for you. But, uh, no, it's a powerful thing. God's plan for us to have life and to have it to the full and to have it freely is for him to involve other people in the process of unwinding us from the stuff that stinks. For me, that's always been a small group. Like, I know some people love small groups, some people hate them, whatever. Uh, but small groups have been a huge part of it. And the reason why is it reminds me that I have a bunch of people in my corner and they remind me who God is and they remind me who I am and as they get to know you as the small group goes longer as these friendships go longer um, something beautiful happens because they eventually see you struggle and they see you stink and they let you know you're still worth loving and that God's not done with you yet doesn't have to be a small group by the way seen it happen also with uh, going out and having coffee with people on a regular basis or meeting certain people for lunch or, or having somebody who's a good friend who knows God. Um, I remember at one point I had this horrible ministry experience and me and this pastor I'd been working for decided to part ways and, and I decided I wasn't cut out for ministry at all. I had nothing to offer. And... Um, I was riddled with inadequacy, and I went down for Christmas to go hang out with a, 
a pastor friend of mine in Oregon. And I ended up staying there a couple of days. I was supposed to go down just for a day and grab dinner with him. And I ended up staying there for three days. And he asked me a really important question at one point. He said, uh, why are you letting this guy that you don't speak highly of, that you don't respect very much, um, define you as a pastor? It was a good question. Um, why was I giving this, this stinky situation so much power over me and not asking God what he wanted to do. <coughs> and something um, broke in me and began to unwind. And the linen strips started to come off a little bit. And I was free to think about ministry again. Um, one of the things I do to keep connections with my friends in AA is I will show up at their Wednesday meetings on occasion and, and sit in. And we have this great relationship. Um, they call me PC, Pastor Chris. Um, and and we hang out together and I was at this meeting and, and the subject of the meeting was um, the requirements to be a part of the group and again and again and again the, by the way the requirements for being in AA is this a, re a desire to stop drinking that's it not even an honest desire they used to say an honest desire, but they decided they couldn't even be honest about it sometimes. So there just has to be a desire to somehow get better. That's it. That's, and they talked about how that looked like in real life. And they talked about making disastrous decisions, um, burning every bridge to the ground, and when their family didn't want to see them any, anymore, when, when everything that they had in their life was burned to the ground, there was a group of people who said, you know what? As long as you want to get better, you're welcome here. We'll love you, even when you don't think you're worth loving. And it made me think of the church. <laughs> what if that's what we're supposed to be like? What if that's how the kingdom of God comes forth? Is we're a group of people who love each other and care about each other no matter what. The only requirement is that we want to get better. What does it look like to unwind each other from these stinky cloths? Galatians 6 says this. Brothers, if somebody gets caught in a sin, they're entangled. You who are spiritually, you who are spiritual should restore him, but gently. I love that. It's not slam him. It's gently, with care and compassion. You should watch yourself so that you don't get tempted. But carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ, the law of love. Let us not get weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up in it. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are part of the family of believers. Carry each other's burdens. Here's the really hard part for me. Let yourself be helped. Man, it's so easy to help each other. It's so hard to let yourself be helped. Even in little things. Let somebody join you in just the littlest thing. And you'll be giving somebody an opportunity to bear a burden with you. We can't do it all. No. None of us can. Part of the American dream is that uh, we can do it all on our own. Pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, make the most of our lives. It's, it's part of the independence and freedom that we love. Um, but I don't think God created us for independence. There's a really cool book out there called Strength Finder. Any of you know it? Yeah, it's a cool book. They, um, they looked at people who are achieving really, really phenomenal things, like high achieving people, and they tried to find what's common among these extraordinary people. What is the common thread between them? And what they figured out about them is that all of them had particular strengths and they spent as much time as possible in those strengths. And then what they did was they surrounded themselves with other people who could handle the weaknesses because those were their strengths. And it's a brilliant thing because so much of life is like, well, I've got this rough edge I've got to work on. I've got to, I've got to work on the things that I'm not so good at. And we spend so much time and energy focused on the thing that we don't do well. 
And what this book suggested was, what if you spend your time doing the things that you're really gifted in, and yet surrounding yourself with other people who are gifted in different things? Um, Paul actually figured this out a heck of a lot earlier. Romans 12, um, fantastic passage about what it means to be a Christian. Um, worship, transforming of the renewing of your mind into God's and then he says this, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You have different gifts according to the grace given you. So if your gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him do it generously. If it's leading, let him govern diligently. And if it's showing mercy, let him show it cheerfully. What Paul's saying is we're the body and we need each other. And we need each other to help us to be free. I can't do a series on freedom. We can't look at how God wants us to be free without talking about the fact that if you want to be free, you're going to have to live in community. You each are fearfully and wonderfully made and bring something to this church that nobody else can bring. Um, one of the mantras of this place is each person makes it better. And it's true, um, because each person is absolutely unique. And I trust your ability to focus even through a car alarm. <laughs> <laughs> No, you have something to offer that nobody else can. Um, I'm a really nice person. I'm a good person to talk to when you're having a really hard day and you can't take a harsh word. I have a friend by the name of Katie who is the exact opposite of me. She loses friends regularly because she speaks blunt truth to people as she sees it. It is an acquired taste to be a friend of Katie, I will tell you. Um, but over time, I've really, really learned to appreciate Katie. Because I can go for a walk with Katie. I can tell her what's going on as best I can. And she will say, Chris, why don't you just cut the blank and tell me how you really feel? She's learned to push through my weakness with her strength. Um, it's a powerful thing in my life. One more story from a small group. Um, I got a phone call while I was doing college ministry in, at ASU, and one of the students who was a part of this small group called, and he said, I can't make it today. My bike got stolen at school. Which is kind of a big deal when that's your only way of getting around, and you live in Arizona. Like, it's hot there, man, and the bus service is not so good. And so um, we said, well, come to small group anyway. One of our, one of, somebody will drive over and pick you up. And one of the ladies offered to do this. And they, they, they drove off to go get him. And one of the guys in the small group goes, I think I have an old bike frame in my garage. And another guy was like, well, I'm really good with tools. I think I have all the tools we need. The only thing we would need is this, this, and this. And I don't know how he knew that, because I couldn't fix a bike to save my life. But I was working with computers at the time, and financially I had the money to just go to the hardware store and get those things. And so I ran to the hardware store with this list and showed it to the hardware store guy, which I've learned is the faster way to get things than me looking, and I usually end up with the wrong things. Um, and he piled them all up, and I brought them back there, and before Gary ever made it to small group, a new bike had been put together for him. And there was this moment of looking around and realizing one girl had a car, one guy had some tools, I had a little bit of money, and if we all used our gifts, Gary had a new bike. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a huge, complicated mess. Uh, but it was powerful. It's an incredible thing if we can do a couple things. Admit we need God and other people. It's hard. I used to always think it was the harder part was serving other people. It's not. It's letting yourself be served. Um, invest in other people especially when they're not lovely <clears throat> let yourself be invested in especially when you're not lovely and be vulnerable and in community if we can put together that recipe 
we will find God unwinding us in freedom and life that is a taste of what we will be when we're in heaven. Um, that's the path we're on. That's the process. So it may stink right now, but it'll stink less and less as we go on together. Sound good? All right, let's pray. God, help us to be honest and help us to be your hands and feet to engage stuff that's a mess both in us and in the world. We want to be used by you and we want to see the world a better place. So help us to be a part of that. Help us to uh, surround ourselves with some other people and to be honest about what we can do for them as well as um, letting them do for us. Lord, we love you.